Hello everyone, here we are. It's time to take a look at what else I saw in November that I didn't already review. It's always extra pleasant when I get to start off by telling you about a movie I really enjoyed, and that's the case here with 1957's Time Without Pity. This British film stars Michael Redgrave as an alcoholic who's just been released from a sanitarium and is rushing to clear his son of a murder charge before his execution. It's a tense crime drama that actually feels a bit like a thriller, thanks to the countdown element. The film's got an excellent cast. Redgrave does his thing as the unstable main character, who is desperate and shattered but sympathetic. This might be one of my favorite of his performances, up there with The Lady Vanishes and The Browning Version. Honorable mention goes to Dead of Night, of course. But the supporting cast makes just as strong an impression. There's Leo McKern, personifying volatility, Anne Todd, Peter Cushing, right before his career really took off, Paul Daneman, Alec McCowan as Redgrave's emotionally precarious son, Renee Houston as an amusing eccentric who collects alarm clocks, and a very young Joan Plowright. Directed by Joseph Losey, the story touches on various heavy issues, alcoholism, capital punishment, and classism, but there's an aesthetic value as well in the film's interesting photography and set design. From its bold beginning to its brilliant conclusion, it's a gripping story, and I would absolutely watch it again. Movie number two is 2019's Midway, a large-scale World War II effort from director Roland Emmerich, which covers early events in the war, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the Doolittle Raid, and focuses on the naval conflicts between the Americans and the Japanese at the pivotal Battle of Midway. I went into this one with mostly low expectations because A, I heard nobody talk about it when it came out, and B, Roland Emmerich is not a dependable filmmaker, yet I was also cautiously optimistic due to the fact that a special premiere screening was held for war veterans, and they enjoyed it. And I felt like, well, if they liked it, there's a good possibility that I'll like it too. My own feelings about the movie are mixed. It's got a loaded cast, including performances from Woody Harrelson, Dennis Quaid, Patrick Wilson, Mandy Moore, Luke Evans, and Ed Scrine? Scrine? I don't know how to pronounce his name, and yet he was arguably the main character. Great. Among others, the actors do a good job, although I wouldn't say anybody makes a huge impression. Nick Jonas, of all people, gave what I thought was one of the most stirring performances. Midway does have lots of that so Emmerich touches, short scenes, many characters, it takes half an hour to get a feel for who the main characters are, and there are a couple dogfighting moments that look like they came straight out of Independence Day. The planes are different, but the maneuvers and the camera work are the same. I'm sure you can find a lot of snarky reviews out there, mocking the movie's dialogue and characterizations and patriotism. It's trying to be 1942, not 2019, and thank goodness, because I don't want to see a World War II movie that feels like 2019. And anyone who thinks it's cheesy would probably think the letters my grandfather wrote to the folks back at home while he was fighting in the Pacific were cheesy too. The emphasis here isn't on edgy storytelling or on a modern crowd-pleasing romance, the purpose is simply to tell the story of the battle and of the men who were involved in it. I think the weakest element is the CGI in the Pearl Harbor attack sequence, which occurs fairly early on. When the movie should have been making a spectacular first impression, my takeaway was, yikes, that looks fake. It's unfortunate. The sinking of the USS Arizona is an important emotional moment, but the poor CGI was just so distracting. However, I appreciate that the film stays focused on the business at hand. Scenes of personal drama are relevant and not overwrought. It's called Midway, and it's actually about Midway. Granted, it's a long movie. It takes over an hour just to get there. But to talk about Midway, especially when a good portion of your audience probably isn't familiar with the facts, you really do have to spend time on certain things leading up to the actual battle. I've seen two other depictions, in the 1976 film of the same name and in the late 80s miniseries War and Remembrance, and found them both confusing. 
Certainly, this interpretation does a better job than the 76 film, which was not cohesive and failed to make me care about its main character's personal problems. This movie's not perfect either, and it has a rocky first act, but it did grow on me, and in the end, I felt it was a fairly good depiction. There's one especially intense action scene, and I liked the ending sequence, which showed that all these characters were, in fact, real people. Keeping the timeline, the men, and the ships straight was still a challenge for me, but I came away with a better grasp on the battle than I had going into it. Honestly, I'm surprised the movie was as good as it was. My parents both really liked it, and so I'd recommend it to similarly-minded, not jaded, war movie fans. Movie number three is a western from 1957 titled Black Patch. I had never heard of this one, but the promotional photo showed a moody-looking man with an eye patch, and that was intriguing enough for me. George Montgomery stars as a marshal who becomes persona non grata in town when he's accused of shooting an old friend in the back. The only thing that's black and white in this one is the cinematography. Good guys make questionable choices, bad guys act honorably. That made it feel at times like the movie was toying with me, but hey, that's the Wild West for ya. The first half or so was very good, I thought. There are no big stars, the only actor I recognized was Sebastian Cabot, but the cast gives fair performances. The latter portion unfortunately faltered. The conclusion seemed either too easy or too preposterous. And okay, there's a fade to black moment that confused me. There's some implied hanky-panky, or at least that's what I took away from it, but the way these two characters act toward each other afterward made it seem like nothing happened. Yet the town gossips are acting like something did happen. So, <laughs> for once I wished things were more spelled out because boy did that make the second half weird as I sat there trying to figure out, well, did they or didn't they? Movie number four is 1952's The Greatest Show on Earth, which I've been meaning to see for a long time. This one's arguably the circus movie to end all circus movies, as it follows the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey around, focusing on two fictional trapeze artists, played by Cornell Wilde and Betty Hutton, competing for the center ring, while the eternal struggle of all circuses to keep the crowds coming plays out around them. The major part of Circus Manager is one of Charlton Heston's first starring roles. His character is gruff, but since he's pushing safety over reckless endangerment, I'm all for it. Wilde and Hutton are both high energy here. He's sporting a French accent, and she's a bit frantic and flighty. I seem to remember she was the same way in Annie Get Your Gun, so maybe that's her shtick. There's very good support from Gloria Graham, who looks great here, from Dorothy L'Amour, who gets some of the funniest lines, and from Jimmy Stewart as Buttons the Clown, a man hiding his true identity behind his makeup. A lot of time is spent showing the mechanics of the circus, the setup, teardown, transportation, etc., and showcasing various real acts, as any circus movie worth its salt should do. There are a couple witty catfights behind the scenes between Hutton and Graham, with Lamore butting in, but the most amazing spectacle was the climactic incident, which I won't give away just in case anyone watching this decides to check out the movie. It was all the better for being unexpected. There are some surprise cameos also. I saw Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, and Edmund O'Brien. Not sure who else I might have missed. It's sort of a musical, since there are a few songs, including a duet between Betty Hutton and Jimmy Stewart on a trampoline. The movie's full of pizzazz, and it's just about what I look for from a Cecil B. DeMille-directed Technicolor Best Picture winner about life under the big top. Movie number five is 1964's Dead Ringer. Betty Davis plays dual roles as twin sisters, one poor and unlucky who resents the other so much that she murders her and takes her place, but she gets more than she bargained for. First things first, I hate the hairstyle, but Davis is great fun here, chewing up the scenery as the two sisters, neither of them great people. You still find yourself hoping the poor sister gets away with the killing though, as she's the more sympathetic of the two. Paul Henreid directed this film. He was Davis's romantic leading man in the 40s in Now Voyager, one of my favorites, and in Deception, and a good friend in real life, too. 
From what I've heard from Henry's daughter Monica, who has an active Twitter account where she faithfully promotes her father's work, they had a good time working together on this movie. Monica Henry herself has a supporting role here as the maid, and it's fun to see her act with Davis as well. I do prefer it when Davis gets to play characters who are a little more calm, regular, and this comes from that later period of her career, which was more bombastic. But Davis was ever the professional and gave every performance her best, even if the style was a far cry from that of the glamorous studio days. Mind you, Dead Ringer isn't on quite the bonkers level of whatever happened to Baby Jane and Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte. It's a solid, entertaining thriller, though. It's got an Andre Previn score that juxtaposes creepy harpsichord sections with light jazz, and it ends with a great twist of irony. It co-stars Peter Lawford, whose character is repulsive, and Carl Malden, whose friendly chump you spend the whole movie feeling sorry for. Oh, and I almost forgot, George McCready has a modest role in this one, as does Cyril Delavanti, a character actor who did a lot of TV work in the 50s and 60s. I think he's adorable, and it was nice to see him. I ended up on an interesting little streak here, as one thing accidentally led to another. Movie number six was the aforementioned Betty Davis and Paul Henry movie, Now Voyager, from 1942. I saw it was on the TCM streaming app, and it was going to be expiring at midnight, and even though we own it, and I've seen it many times, and I had other things to do, I just couldn't resist. I meant to just have it on in the background while I did some editing, but from the moment Claude Rains appeared in the film, which is about two minutes into it, I just couldn't not pay attention. I love this one, but I'm not going to go on about it because I've already reviewed it. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on it, go watch that video. Moving on to movie number seven, which was 1944's The Conspirators. This World War II drama stars, what do you know, Paul Henreid as a Dutch freedom fighter making contact with a resistance band in Lisbon who has a run-in with a mysterious woman who turns out to be the wife of a German official. This woman is played by Hedy Lamarr, so you've got two Austrians as your leads, one playing a French woman, the other playing a Dutchman. Beautiful Hedy Lamarr and dreamy Paul Henry make an appealing pair, easy on the eyes and ears of course. This was like deja vu for Henry, as the part he plays is so similar to his role as Victor Laszlo in Casablanca. The greatest misfortune for The Conspirators, which isn't a bad movie, is that it is so strongly reminiscent of Casablanca, which came out just two years before. And I'm sorry if it bothers you when I say Casablanca and not Casablanca. I don't know, it just, that doesn't come naturally to me. One can't help comparing the two and finding Casablanca superior on just about every point. Lamar, who'd turned down the role of Ilsa, was supposedly especially sore about this, not that you can tell from her performance here. I don't want to harp on the comparison, though, because I don't think it's totally fair. So, moving on, Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet co-star here as part of the Resistance Band. I'd have liked to see Lorre get a little more to do, and the other members of the band could have been more developed, since we're supposed to wonder if one of them is a spy. Hard to generate tension on that point when we hardly ever see them. Likewise, the antagonists, had they been more potent, could have been a greater threat. And hey, by the way, George McCready makes an appearance here in an uncredited bit part as a heavy, one of his earliest roles. Everything's connected today! The story's interesting, though, with generous doses of adventure and atmosphere and some voguish gowns for the leading lady. I'd wanted to see it for a long time, and I'm glad I finally did, even if it wasn't a life-changing event. Movie number eight is a Mexican film from 1934 titled Dos Monjes, or Two Monks. I had never heard of this one before, but when I looked it up, I saw it described as Caligari-like and creepy, so I had to check it out. The story is relatively simple. In a monastery, one monk viciously attacks another, hitting him on the head with a crucifix. The rest of the film explains why. What unfolds in a flashback seems to be a pretty basic love triangle involving a sickly musician, the girl next door, and his old friend who comes back to town. There's an act of violence, and that prompts a vow of revenge. 
at a certain point, I believed the movie was wrapping up, and I felt a lukewarm reaction to the whole thing. Why did I bother? It had a couple cool shots, but nothing special, and it was pretty slow. But it was at that point things took a sudden turn. In a word, the movie Rashomon's. It's not exactly the Rashomon effect, but it's close enough, and 16 years before Rashomon was released. We go back through the flashback, but this time seeing certain scenes again with new information, or viewing a scene from a different perspective. It's good stuff. Then at the end, the movie goes a little crazy. I suppose this is where the German influence really kicks in, with a literal crescendo at a huge organ and a chaotic hallucination. It has its drawbacks. Like I said, the pace is slow, and for at least part of it, the characters seem one-dimensional and stiffly acted. There are also a couple crane shots that are a little wobbly, but if you like German films of the 20s, you should check out this Spanish-language take on the style, directed by Juan Bustillo Oro. The film isn't scary, but it is creepy and disturbing in an artsy way, expressionistic in its moody use of angles, lighting, and shadows. Movie number 9 is 1966's A Man for All Seasons, the biographical drama about Sir Thomas More, who stood up to King Henry VIII by rejecting the annulment of his first marriage to Catherine of Aragon and refusing to sign an oath that declared the king supreme leader of the newly established Church of England. More will not openly protest Henry's actions. On the contrary, he repeatedly affirms his loyalty to the king, but his unwavering, silent refusal to fall in line so irks the court that he becomes a target. I've known about this movie for years, though uh, at times I've confused it with The Lion in Winter, but I've never seen it until now. Directed by Fred Zinneman and adapted by Robert Bolt from his own award-winning play, it's an excellent film. I didn't brush up on my rusty Tudor family history before diving in, but that wasn't much of a problem because the story's so well told that it's relatively easy to follow, and ultimately Sir Thomas More is a relatable character no matter how deep your knowledge of the logistics of the situation goes. Passage of Time is brilliantly managed. The film doesn't show every little thing that happens, but moves smoothly and economically from one phase to the next without missing a beat. The writing is sharp, powerful, and occasionally witty when characters deliver thinly veiled insults. Paul Schofield leads the star-studded, mostly English cast, reprising his Tony Award-winning performance and earning himself the Oscar. It's a performance that gets better and better as it builds to the final, passionate speech. The rest of the cast features a mix of established names and up-and-comers. Robert Shaw is a boisterous, temperamental Henry VIII, shouting half his lines. Wendy Hiller is great as Moore's crusty wife. Leo McCurran kills it as Thomas Cromwell, portrayed as the chief antagonist, whose hunger to drag Moore down seems to stem as much from personal dislike as it does from duty to the king. Likewise, then-unknown John Hurt shines in his first prominent film role as a social-climbing toady. Other key players in the cast are Susanna York, Corin Redgrave, Nigel Davenport, and in a brief but important appearance, Orson Welles as Cardinal Wolsey, looking awful. The film does have a slowish start, but it picks up steam as it goes, the result being a very good and timeless story about staying true to your convictions and not compromising even when threatened with the loss of your position, your property, your freedom, and your life. And movie number 10 is, hey, a Christmas movie, The Holly and the Ivy. This is a British film from 1952 in which Ralph Richardson plays an aging vicar and a widower who finds himself at odds with his adult children when they come home for Christmas. He's been so wrapped up in his work that he hasn't noticed the unhappiness in his own family as the children have concealed their true desires and struggles so as not to disappoint him. The three children are Celia Johnson as the eldest who wants to get married but feels it's her duty to stay with her father, Denholm Elliott as the good-natured but rebellious son, and Margaret Layton who avoids home and tries to lose herself in the city. As you've probably already guessed, this is not exactly the feel-good, fluffy Christmas movie you typically find today. It can be a bit of a downer, if that's what you're looking for. And there's an element of the story that I won't say hits close to home for me, but it's approaching the county. 
but that doesn't mean it was a bad movie, and I did enjoy it. The performances were very good, and it's not as dreary as it sounds, not all the time. There's actually quite a bit of humor as the characters hustle and bustle around with last-minute decorating, and as everyone's patience is tested by the two hilarious aunts who come to visit and are usually on the brink of making an uncomfortable situation even more awkward. It's an unconventional Christmas movie by our standards, on the bittersweet side, but one to check out if you're looking for something different, something new, and I promise there's a happy resolution at the end of this reluctant family reunion. And that's what else I saw in November. I did actually hope to get a couple more movies in there. I have them waiting. Jojo Rabbit and Bombshell, the documentary about Hedy Lamarr that came out a couple years ago. But I ran out of time, so you'll just have to stay tuned and hear what I thought of them in the December video. Alright, you know the drill. You can find a list of the movies I mentioned in the description. Please feel free to share your thoughts on any of these films in the comments below, and I'll be back with a new review next week. Thanks for watching.